Ladies and gentlemen, we, we can start now this uh, session. It's a new kind of uh, session. It's called SAL, Single Author Lecture. And we are very honored today to have Xavier Lepichon with us. Xavier has a, such a list of uh, title and uh, that if I give you half of it, it will take one hour. So I only say that it's uh, Collège de France, Academy of Science, and is one of the fathers of the plate tectonics paradigm. And today he's uh, uh, addressing us on a different problem, which is uh, Pangea and Lower Mantle, with a subtitle, are we entering now into a new paradigm from plate tectonics to global tectonics? And this is, is going to tell us why he believes in this. This is uh, a absolutely new uh, ideas which were uh, discussed in particular to a recent meeting in Paris at the Collège de France. And it gave very, very interesting and dynamic discussion. So, Xavier. Is that working? Yes. yes. OK. Uh, I guess it's the privilege of the age that uh, having known the birth of plate tectonics uh, and looking at uh, what's happening now, I got the feeling that we were entering a new transition. And this is what I would like to talk to you about uh, uh, today. Um, I'm happy that uh, you were courageous enough to stay there at seven instead of going to dinner, and I hope you will not be too frustrated by what I say. Now I'm supposed to move like that. No, it's okay. Uh, this is actually a work I did with uh, Jelal Shengor, who is here, and Shaner Imren, who is in Istanbul, and that we have uh, submitted to Tectonics, and um, we are still waiting for the reviews. We were expecting to have some discussion for reviewers, so we, are, we, we, we will see, but you will judge by yourself. We are not really in the stream of the present day ideas. Now, uh, my point is that in the 60s, and this is something that I, um, have uh, written for an article that will be published in Tectonics. Earth science were in a super cool state. Uh, you know that uh, when a liquid is super cooled, it goes below the freezing point but is not transformed into a solid. And then if you have some shock or anything happening, boom it's immediately crystallizes, and you have this immediate ch change. And uh, my point is that, say, between 59, 1959 and 1967, we were in this stage of uh, supercooling, where anything could lead to, to the change. And we have an example of that. Uh, one of them is, of course, the magnetic anomalies of uh, Vine and Matthews, but were also by Morley and La Rochelle, completely independently at the same time using two different paths in 1963. And then you had in 1967 the use of spherical uh, plate kinematics that was proposed first by Jason Morgan and then independently by Dan McKenzie. And there again, you know, the idea was were just coming and Actually, other people had the ID before, but did not fully use it, and so on. So that we are in a state where we know we have to change, because it doesn't fit anymore, the, the framework in which we are. But 
we are not sure and things are coming and there are a lot of contradiction, but we see the light, we see something happening. Um, so, uh, in this transistor state, the, the, the characteristic is a lot of exciting insights, but also many apparent contradictions. I argue here tonight that we enter into a similar era where we will be able to relate without ambiguity plate tectonics to mental dynamics. I argue further that the key for this is to understand the significance of Pangea. And for that I will spend some time because I think people have missed the significance of Pangea. They have passed next to some very important point that I will try to, to develop for you. My main point is looking at the last 350 million years, at least, the, that we can see. There has been two different types of tectonics. The first one was the single continent, Pangea, with a single ocean, Pantalassa. And it continued during more than 200 million years. The character, and I will demonstrate that to you, it, a perfect polar hemisphere. It occupies exactly half of the Earth. So it's something of order one, as far as harmony is concerned. And separated by subduction zone with an axis of symmetry in the equatorial plane. That is a very important point. Then the second type is dispersed continents since what we have called with Philippe Huchombe in 1984, the Cretaceous Catastrophe. Yeah. I think in French it's even better. La Catastrophe Crétacé, you know. <laughs> we, we like the emphasis, which is about 100 million years ago, where suddenly there was a dispersal outside of this hemisphere. The first mode is the normal mode. And in this mode, the continents are strictly contained within a single polar hemisphere surrounded by a subduction zone, which provide a fixed reference frame tied to the lower mantle. Now, this is remarkable because 250 million years is a long time. During 250 million years, you know, continents occupied a whole hemisphere, and the tectonic then naturally had to be completely different, completely different. There were only a small portion of ocean, the tethys of about 20% of the surface. The second one, the one in which we live now, is the default transitory uh, mode. Presumably will not last too long. So, to, to understand that, I, and to familiarize you with the, uh, the projection I will use, because they are very convenient to, to explain what I will do, um, I show this. This is an equal area map of the present day ocean and continent. Uh, simply, you have the first, the red circle, is one hemisphere, and the other hemisphere, we prolongate the projection outside of the whole Earth. So, of course, it's very distorted. But the main advantage, it shows you exactly where is the hemisphere and how it fits the Pangea when we will come to Pangea. The second point, this red circle is not just a haphazard red, red circle. It's the one which has for axis of symmetry uh, in the equatorial plane, the axis of symmetry of the present geoid. The present geoid is governed by this axis in the equatorial plane with this great circle. And it turns out, this has been demonstrated in the last few years, that it is also the axis of symmetry of the lower mantle masses. So both have the same axis of symmetry and it, this great circle that goes through the geographic pole. 
Okay. Now, this stage is the present state of the Earth. And what I've shown here is the continental side, if you want, the nearly Pangea, because it's simply due to the fact that it has progressively escaped. The continents have partly escaped outside of this great circle in which they were contained previously. Now, if I look at the other side, then you have this projection, where now you see the Pacific Ocean, and then the few continents around, the same great circle with the axis of symmetry, which is nearly fully ocean, but not completely. And that, 100 million years ago, was fully ocean. This is the recent change. Now, in 1984, with Philippe Huchon, we published in Earth Planetary Science Letters a paper that I will not go into it, but we already pointed out this fact that has not really been taken into account by people. Uh, that starting perhaps 350 million years ago, but this reconstruction especially dates from uh, quite a long time ago, uh, the reconstruction in Devonian is, is rather fragile and, and certainly it might change nowadays. But more or less it fitted within a great circle. But when you move to 200 million years, there was no, no, no hesitation. These continents were clearly within a great circle, surrounded by subduction zone, and not where the paleomagnetics indicates where is the geographic pole of rotation. It is very close to, to, to uh, be on the, on the great circle, and it indicates that it was really a hemisphere with an equatorial axis of symmetry, you see. Um, and this continued, you know, many people say after 200 million years, Pangea is finished. No, that's not true. It continues inside this great circle until the big catastrophe Cretacé 100 million years ago. You see that at 125 million years, and we will see that better, because you might say this is long, long ago and it may not be like that now. So I will first try to discuss the main character of this first phase where you have the order one, you know, harmonics in the, at the surface of the Earth, continent on one side, ocean the other, and it's an hemisphere uh, which goes through the geographic pole, the poles of rotation that separate them, and this hemisphere is occupied by subduction zone all around. So what I did is, what we did, actually uh, all these beautiful illustrations were made by um, our friend Chaner Imren, who I had him working very hard on that. It, and all we did was take the reconstruction as they are published now, and in this case we took the reconstruction of Muller et al, 2016, which are widely used. And as it doesn't talk at all about the fact that it fits within a great circle, I con we conclude that he was not prejudiced and did not try to fit the thing into a great circle. But look now, the continents are in gray. Look how, how well the gray fits the great circle. And how if it's, you see, the two crosses with a small ellipse around, around are the two geographic poles at the time. See how it fits an exact hemisphere. You know, this is spectacular. Now, the colors uh, in the system of Muller et al. represent the edges that they reconstructed. Uh, it's partly hypothetical, but still it's, uh, it's there. And the more red it is, the youngest. The more blue, green, and so on, the oldest. And what you see immediately is first, 
that the continents occupied a whole hemisphere. Uh, actually, there, are there is 20 percent occupied by ocean, but 80 uh, percent is occupied by, by land, by continents. And actually, if you if you simply play a little bit with the thickness and uh, all the things, you find out that it could easily fit and be a continent filling the whole thing, even the, the Tethys. So what happens is that continental material was inserted within this hemisphere and in such a way that it fills the hemisphere. When did that happen? When did it begin? That's another question. But by the time it has filled the hemisphere, if it is constrained to stay within it, clearly there is no choice. You, erosion will take care of anything you put too much in it, you see. It will be a steady state and the volume of continental material will be limited by necessity. And that's an, an interesting point. The second interesting point is the fact that you have a piece of ocean that we call Tethys. The red part is the new Tethys, the neo -tetis. The blue part is the paleo -tetis. And what will happen is that uh, you have a transfer from one to the other. In other words, paleo -tetis will disappear and at the expense of neo -tetis. That's the only way you can do things here is to transfer from one piece of ocean to another. You are in this system in a kind of merry-go-around, you see, for the continents. All they can do is turn in circle and try to transfer using a little bit of this, uh, this uh, Tethys system. That's very special because it's during more than 200 million years. Do you think the tectonic is the same and when the continents are free to move around and so on? They constrain motion. Nobody worries about that. Could it be that it gives the same tectonics? I don't believe so, and we'll see other reasons why. The second thing is the fact that you have the tethys. Now, this is a small part, 20%, but it changed the aspect ratio for the thermal system. And that means that it changes by a factor of two. That means that you can escape much more heat than if you had only continent. And that's an important point, of course. But it's also true for whatever, and we'll see that in more detail, uh, plume material will accumulate below. You know, because remember, it stays in the same place. So plume material will accumulate and we'll see why. And because there is this accumulation, you can escape through the subduction zone on the side, and you can escape through the tethys. A third reason is very interesting, too. You know, with this system in which you have an axis of symmetry in the equatorial plane, uh, any, any vertical, any axis uh, perpendicular to it will be a maximum axis of, of uh, uh, moment of inertia for, for the axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation could move around anywhere, it will be the same. See, it, 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 there is no privileged position. And you might expect the, 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 the axis of the pole to, to move around. But you have Tethys. And Tethys has subduction zone. And the subduction zone are going to stabilize the moment of inertia and try to maintain, because you will remember that the main subduction zone in Tethys, the most important, are generally to the north. Not always, but generally to the north. And they are always near the equator. You will see that later on. So that will maintain the stabilization of the Earth. OK, so, sorry. Now look at what happened when you look at, you move from 220 to 200, 280, 260. You are still within the same system. All you do is the merry-go-around. 
And you do that by closing the paleothetis and producing the formation of the uh, widening the neothetis. And you begin to see the, the fracture that appear and that will become uh, the Atlantic and Indian Ocean. So, to summarize, this is a hemisphere that has concentrated all the continents and presumably stabilized the total volume of continents that will not be able to change more. Second, there is a tethy surface which has a role of ventilation of heat but also of evacuation of plume material. Third, east-west tethys subduction maximizes movement of inertia along Earth rotation axis and prevents polar wonder. And finally, any migration of away from equator leads to circular motion of Pangaea to adjust. So this is done by transfer of pieces from Gondwana to Laurasia with clockwise overall motion. Okay, now let's look at the Cretaceous catastrophe and the dispersal phase. What you see is that starting 140, then uh, I think I have actually a way if he told me that there was some fancy stuff to get. What was it? I don't remember. He told me. No. I have completely forgot how you... No, no, just to have the pointer. You can use this. No, but you see, this one is much better. Yeah, but then you have. But you to don't know how to use it. Okay, no, you are like me. No, no, there is a pointer, and you can. Ah, see the, okay. I don't have to look there. No, you just have to look. <laughs> okay, that's very clever. Okay. So now I don't know. What, I don't know anymore what I was going to point to. <laughs> okay, I was. I think we passed several things. This, I'm coming back there? No, I'm, I'm advancing. I want to, to go back. I'm sorry for this real disruption, but we are talking about the disruption of Pangaea, so that's all right. So look at this now. Uh, when, what you see that until 100 million years ago, not very convenient to do that. I prefer to look over there. I think I'm going to change. Come back. To, but maybe you see nothing. That's all right. Okay. Now you see that um, the the until 120 million years, everything is still fairly well within the Great Circle, and even at 100 million years, you have begun to move out essentially because you begin to create the Atlantic Ocean and you begin to create the Indian Ocean, okay? But then after that, it's clear that everything is coming out. You see, you have Antarctica and Australia really get, getting out of the circle. You have North America and Eurasia. North America and Eurasia, it's related to the opening of the Atlantic, and this is related to the opening of the uh, Indian Ocean. Um, then you move to, to 60 million years, and by, by 40 million years, you have, by 40 million years, you have really, uh, the tethys has completely disappeared. So up to that time, a lot of the space was taken by closing the tethys. From now on, the only possibility is to move out uh, uh, this continent out of, of the system. So, what was the cause? Many people have discussed, and including Don Anderson, the fact that if you have a cap of continent of a whole hemisphere, you accumulate heat if it doesn't move with respect to the underlying mantle. And the increase of temperature has been measured by, model by a few people, including Coltis recently, <laughs> and it's around, Coltis and collaborators, and it's around 100 degrees centigrade for the mantle below the, the crust. 
So you have that. And second, if plume material is coming, and we'll discuss that, the plume material will tend to accumulate below uh, the lithosphere. Because remember, the lithosphere of the continental, we'll point that out later on, is uh, very thick. It goes down to more than 150, 200 kilometers and tend to, to limit this progression. So you have a, a great deal of reservoir of, of magma that whenever you fracture will be a potential source of huge lubrication and then flood basal. So the, finally, there was the necessity of venting and you get the Cretaceous catastrophe. By two ways, this has been discussed in the literature. Um, both the fact, internal way, in a sense, scissor closing of the tethys, and then external way coming out of this critical. But the two get together, actually. OK. Then now look at, uh, you remember this way of uh, learning, of, of seeing the, 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 the world. Now we are looking at the Pacific Hemisphere. Remember this great, great, great circle? The red one is this great circle that uh, has the equatorial axis of symmetry and that was enclosing Pangaea. Now if you look at that, you immediately see one thing, the remarkable asymmetry between the west and the east. You see continents have invaded the Pacific from the, from the west, up to nearly the center of this. And the maximum is off Australia. You see. And then it decreases in both ways. And then South America has not budged. It's still there. And then you have a progression. So you have an asymmetry between no progression toward Talassa on one side, on the South American side, and major progression on the west, and especially the southwest. Uh, by the way, this is a very detailed topography that was inserted in it. It's probably too much detail, but uh, Channer absolutely wanted to do it, so we did it. Then if you look now at the continental side, now it's very interesting to look at that. Notice that uh, you immediately recognize that uh, with the Atlantic opening, you are moving Africa and less Eurasia because you had the closure of Tethys in between, but sufficiently to move it outside. Then the second thing is you are moving here in North America. But to the south, Notice south of this limit, which is nearly continuous, the whole system is really related to the expulsion of Australia and all the arcs to the north of Australia. Uh, so this is a system which is completely different to the south of the Atlantic and, and which corresponds to the south of the uh, Indian Ocean completely different to what happened in the north, which is related simply to the Caesar closing of Tethys. Okay, now um, let me go back. One thing that I forgot to, uh, forgot to mention, which is uh, important. Of course, you have noticed it, but on this side, you have no marginal basins. On this side, you have a huge amount of marginal basins. This is the side which advanced. This is the side that did not advance. I forgot to mention that. OK. Now, let's look now at something that has been pointed out by Dan McKenzie and his collaborator, and I think is extremely important. It is the structure of Pangaea. Now, let's look at his, uh, the way he used it. He used an oblique mercator which I think is a, a mistake. Uh, Sometimes even good people like Dan do mistakes. And uh, it's, uh, but it's there. What he has done is simply to, to take a reconstruction of Pangaea 
Uh, you have here the identification of the different pieces. And then he has used the places where now from uh, S waves you get thickness of the lithosphere. And the thickness of lithosphere is indicated here. And you see all the central part, which makes the core of Pangaea, is made of lithosphere which is extremely thick, as an average 200 kilometer or more. Huge cratons, you know, which occupy all the central part. Now, on the outside, you have thinner lithosphere, which is related to the effect of the subduction zone that have been acted there upon more than 250 million years, and that who have fragilized this whole system. It's between this green and yellow thing. And then around Tethys, to the south of Tethys, because he has nothing in this part of Asia there, uh, you have thinner lithosphere again. So you have a system in which you have a very strong core of thick lithosphere, more than 200 kilometers, surrounded to the south by what he calls the Pangeite, this orogenic axis which was related to the, to the subduction there, and to the north to the different <coughs> subduction zones that were active to the north, but also that have been active sometimes to the south, a lot of tectonics. So, uh, I put that in, uh, we put that in our, uh, in our system. For the moment being, ignore the red thing. The red things are the uh, flood basalt area, and I will talk about that. But let's just consider the, the limit of the very thick lithosphere. It's between this yellow thing outside, and the green thing inside. So all this area is thick lithosphere. And to the south, uh, you have the part related to the subduction zone around, which has been thinned by the subduction zone. And then the part related to, te to Tethys, and presumably that extends over there too. So it's a very special system in which you have a core, quite thick, quite wide, and then on each side something that can, is much thinner and can let escape the magma uh, much more easily, laterally, for two reasons. Because when you are at 200 and, or 250 kilometers, you are well uh, below the fusion point for the, for the magma. But when you are at less than 100 kilometers, you can begin to have partial fusion, and you, you can have escape of the magma much more easily. So it's much easier to escape this plume material when it is below the thin thing than when it is below the, the thick area. Now, um, I will talk about the... I, I will summarize that. Huh? So you have the, the core of Pangaea is a three, five, four thousand kilometer wide, thick cratonic lithosphere, more of average 200 kilometers thick, which form the core of Pangaea between the thin Pangaeite, that's the, way, the thing they called, uh, some people would not agree perhaps with this name, and the Tethys provinces. Around it, subduction produces specific two, three thousand kilometer wide tectonic belt with thinner lithosphere, and the southern part corresponds to the Samfro geosyncline of Dutuat, 1937, for the people who are geologists and know that perfectly. Within it, the tectonically active Tethys provinces affected by subduction also have a thin lithosphere. So you see this escape that we had for the heat also acts in a much stronger way for the plume material. We come now to the question of flood basalt. And that's a very important question. Uh, now look at this red thing. Uh, this 
are the edges. And as you know, the edge uh, is uh, very narrow, 250 million years. That's the Sib Siberia flood basalt. Huge area. Uh, my friend Jelal Shengor has worked a lot on that, and he could tell uh, things on that that I cannot tell. Then you have the Camperia, 201 million years. Now, the Camperia is remarkable. It's 12 million square kilometers. You know, 12 million, it covers part of North America, part of Africa, and pa part of uh, Northern South America. 201 million years, you know, nearly instantaneous. But uh, some people now tell, tell me and tell us that uh, they can find a single point which is the source of the basalt, and the, 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 the flood basalt, and that they can relate directly to, to the core. Now, I think this is preposterous. I mean, this huge thing cannot be done by one single point. And, and this is very clear if you look, for example, the history of, of uh, camp. Uh, 20 million years before, uh, about uh, 220 million years in Orion, you begin to see fracturation. You begin to see long fracturation along this, this whole direction. And that extends into the whole Tethys area. And along that, you find in the Tethys area volcanics, uh, which are of a different type and are produced. Clearly, the fracturation comes first. Then 20 million years later, you have suddenly this huge outpouring along fractures that pre-existed. So it's not the plume that created the fractures. It's the fracture that uh, uh, allowed the plume to come to the surface. And the proof is that the fracture continued along Tethys line in the fracturing there, but did not produce flood basalt. Why? Because you come out of the thick lithosphere area. Because this is the other remarkable fact. When you look at all these things coming from Siberian trap, the uh, camp area, then after that, the Karoo at 183, then the Parana and the, um, uh, I, I, I lost, uh, that's my age, you see, I, I, I think that I know very well, but it's, uh, you know, the Indian thing. Deca. Not Deca, no, no, uh, it's just opposite. Uh, Raj Mahal, thank you, Raj Mahal. I'm sorry, I should know that. I've worked a lot on that. Raj Mahal, and then uh, finally uh, Deccan and the Mad Madagascar next to it. But what you see that all of them, without exception, are of a thick cratonic space. They are exclusively within the thick cratonic area. None is of a thin lithosphere. And the answer is simple. It's physics stupid. It's physics. It's too deep to allow things. So, okay. Um, this tells you, of course, I put that on the 220 million years reconstruction. You immediately recognize that this was not there at the time. It's just that you see where, where it will be produced as, as it comes. But that is an important point. And what we have is these are pre-opening, Siberia, and this one here. 183 becomes close to the opening, and after it's post-opening, 132, 90, 66, and so on. But look also the progression of fracturing in a uh, clockwise fashion. So, Flood basalt only affect the thick Cretan province. They migrate from north to south from 250 million years to 60 million years, Siberia to Deccan. They are preceded by 20, 10 million years of fracturation and moderate different volcanism. They appear during breakup leading to opening and oceanization, spectacular example of camp, because they tap the asthenospheric plume reservoir. And I will come later to that. They may lead to continuous volcanic 
trap, interpreted as hotspot, but that face relative kinematics of opening. I will say a few words, but I don't have time to, to go on that. For example, the shagos come like the 90s are along uh, things that are clearly parallel to transform fault. And second, they have the shagos, you see the thickness is very large next to India and progressively decreases southward, so it's being fed from uh, the north. Uh, then, it indicates that magma accumulated below the lithosphere and was released by breakup. Then I come to the problem of the absolute frame of reference. And I take just the Müller et al. Uh, reconstruction. Now, in this reconstruction, we have moved the reconstruction so that it fits within this equatorial, this, uh, this great circle, with the proper, uh, the frame of reference, same frame of reference than the geo, present geoid and, and the lowermost mantle. Now, if I take the actual Mueller reconstruction, here's what it gives. It's outside by about 20 degrees. Now, of course, and I think that's what they say, you can say, well, it's just because the, the mantle has shifted. The thing and the mantle have shifted. Uh, we argue that uh, it's not the mental that has shifted, but that it's their absolute reconstruction, which is not correct. Now, I use here an, an interesting paper by Williams et al., uh, 2015, which is the same type of... Uh, uh, they all use the same type of reconstruction. Now, it's very interesting <laughs> to see that, because... This is a point in Africa. And now, this is the track of the point up to 130 million years, according to different frames of reference. Now, this you can ignore. It's paleomag, and they assume that Africa has not moved east or west. So it's just a hypothesis, but it doesn't demonstrate anything. But then you, you have here all the hotspot related. And you have, to, as you know, two hotspot type. The frame of reference is Pacific, and then the frame of reference is Indo-Atlantic. Now, in the last 50, 40, 50 million years, the Pacific prevails. And, and uh, you can see that they all follow approximately the same thing. Uh, Africa is moving to the northeast. But as you begin to arrive here, you lose the Pacific tracks. And, and uh, then you begin to enter in this system there, which I think is, is wrong. On the other hand, uh, you see here two things that uh, continue and actually fit our frame, the frame of reference uh, that we propose, which is simply assuming that the mental has, lower most mental has not shifted, and which is one, the slab reference, you know, that you take the slab and, and you take them as indication that uh, this was the position, so it, the reference is reference to the slab system. And you see it fits fairly well, it goes here to here. And then you have the one which is no net rotation. You know, in this system you assume that, uh, that uh, the the sum of the moments of forces acting below the lithosphere is zero, which people say it's ridiculous because you have, it would assume the same viscosity everywhere which is not present, so they think it cannot be a good frame. But it's the best. So uh, there may be some compensation or I don't know what. Anyway, my point is, uh, first, when people tell us we have a good frame of reference, we have the best one, we have to, maybe, but it's, there is still a lot of uncertainty. My second point is taking this reference to the lowermost mantle and assuming it has not changed, it's probably the best reference. Let me just briefly mention there, because I, cannot, I don't have time to enter into that. These are simply the, I guess you recognize that it's, it's from, uh, a free air gravity map, but you see 
present-day Fria gravity map. And what you see here is the Chagos Lakadiv, and what you see here is the 90 East. Actually, the 90 East enters below, below the trench here, and uh, I, I think well, we have work on that. We can follow it up, up to here. What is remarkable is that both follow the same small circle, uh, which are the one related to the closing of the Tethys. They are clearly related to the track of, uh, uh, of India, and I think they are related to kinematics, and that's the point I was making uh, earlier. Relative kinematic. This is the one of the NNR uh, proposition, you know, Argus et al. 2011, um, and uh, I just want to point out that in this system, South America is barely moving. You see the numbers here are in millimeters per, per year. So it's less than 10. And it's the, the slowest one with uh, part of Antarctica, but not all. So it's really the slowest moving one. Africa is moving at 20, 25. And then you have the very fast thing, uh, Europe thing, Eurasia, 2025. 20, then you have very fast convergence between this oceanic system in the Indian Ocean, 70 everywhere, 70 in the Pacific Ocean. That's the convergence to the west of Pacific, and then convergence to South America, about 70. I think this is probably a fair approximation of, of what uh, is the actual absolute motion. So let's summarize. Most used frames of reference assume some links to Pacific and or Indian hotspot. They strongly disagreed with Pangea fixed frame of reference between 60 and 130, but they were mostly based on Indo-Atlantic hotspot that I consider for this time probably uh, unreliable. And NNR and SLAB reference agree on the other hand with that. I think I'm a little bit late, so I should accelerate somewhat. I want to look now at uh, what happens below and what we know about below. And uh, it's not my specialty, so it's a look from somebody who is outside. But sometimes when you are outside, you see things that some people not obviously look uh, in it. Well, plate tectonic initial formulation was an upper mental phenomenon, dominated by the formation of motion of a strong thermal boundary layer that kept its identity as it written within the mantle. It has been progressively replaced by a whole mantle convection model with diffuse plume uplift and concentrated slab thinking in the last 20, um, 20 years or so. And I think the main character of this, and, and come from that, is because the lowermost mantle is a considered as a slab's graveyard. This has been one of the propositions by the people. Uh, the slab go all the way to there, and, and they have a very strong influence. And then around uh, a system which becomes, which is rather enigmatic, which is a system which is uh, opposite side uh, with an equatorial axis of rotation, and which is a plume's feeder. It, it feeds plume to the surface. The shift from upper mantle to whole mantle was... Uh, really triggered by the discovery that at the core surface in the lower smooth mantle there is a distribution of mass strongly dominated by order two with an equatorial axis of symmetry that explains most of the geoid and provides a direct link to the rotation of the Earth. It consists of two antipodal large low shear velocity provinces, LL, SVP, that are feeders of plume. Okay? Uh, now, uh, and uh, Peter Molnar just uh, is working on a synthesis of what he thinks about the mantle. And he used that as the standard model that was used during 20, 20 years. It's Garnero and McNamara to 2008. But basically, it's slabs coming down and forming a big pile on one side. And then something that we don't know what it is exactly that is very hot and that produce plumes that come all the way to the surface. The whole thing being governed by this equatorial axis of symmetry. Now, what is very spectacular that whoever does this kind of thing, you see the low velocity zone, 
they, they find the same thing. And in, indeed, there, there is the Pacific one, the Atlantic one, but not how, how, how different they are. This one is clearly quite different from this one. But if you take the harmonics of order two, you find that it's just the equatorial axis fits uh, very nicely. And um, not also the, the remarkable correspondence with the geoid. This is the present day geoid. The high are like that, and this is the negative. And you see this red circle I was mentioning that follows approximately the, the axis of the negative. And then this is the African high, which resembles very much what you have in this uh, low velocity zone uh, in the lower mantle, immediately below, well, 2,900 kilometers below. Then the Pacific, which is much more like that, but which is also very similar to what you have in the, the geoid. Clearly, the geoid is strongly influenced and strongly modeled by, by the presence of these masses, and everybody agrees on that. And uh, uh, Zievonsky et al. and others pointed out that if you take the order two of whatever the model, you end up with something which has an axis in the equatorial plane. And uh, they pointed out also that if you look at the paleomagnetic pole, in this case they use Bess and Cortillo, they follow the main great circle, which is where you could put any, any place the axis of rotation and you will have uh, a maximum amount of inertia. I argued that with the Tetis, uh, there was no easy way of moving out of that. Finally, the, the other thing that, uh, that comes from uh, Barbara Romanovich, 2018, same, it's the presentation she made in Paris last year. Uh, it's uh, this two uh, low velocity zone in red, and she shows what she called plumes that they can fall all the way, and the primary plume, there are 11 primary plumes. And what I mean, very interested, she doesn't mention it, but I do, uh, out of the 11 plume, only one, number one, in Afar is located below a continent. The 10 others are below ocean ecclitosphere. And if you take the 27 plumes, even the less, it's still the same thing. You have not more than two or three plumes below uh, continental lithosphere, and all the other are below uh, oceanic lithosphere. And I think that explains one thing, that to be able to come all the way to, to the surface, uh, you have to have a lithosphere which is not too thick. Now, what, how can this whole mantle convection be reconciled with apparent very strong barrier at base of upper mantle, and with apparent much stronger circulation in upper mantle? Now, I talk about something that is not too much mentioned, but which is very important. The first one is the transition zone reservoir of slab. Now, the transition zone of Boulen, Boulen was uh, between 400 kilometers and uh, roughly 1,000 kilometers. The main phase change is at 660, as you know. And the work of Fukao and Obayashi that everybody is using now, 2013, shows clearly that of Japan, for example, you have slabs coming down and then just spreading above the 660 discontinuity. Uh, now you see that this spreading uh, occurs for lengths that include uh, at least two or three times uh, the length of the total slab going down there. And second, they are significantly thicker. So that means that uh, uh, the time spent in this, uh, in this reservoir is at least twice, two or three times, the time necessary to come down there, which is, you conclude that it's about 200 million years spent in this area. Now, if you look at uh, Tonga, further south, you find that this time it goes to 1,000 kilometers. Now that's an important discovery that's coming out. There is a, a, a rheological discontinuity around 1,000 kilometers with a stiffening of the mantle, probably an increase of 
people talk about an order of magnitude <coughs> of viscosity. And uh, then you have also the same thing happening, and there also they can spend up to 200 million years in this reservoir. But you have some places like of Central America where when they, it's especially when it's especially steep, steep, they go directly below into the lower mantle. Uh, you see the change where they stay there and go in the mantle. So the conclusion is simple. Uh, slabs stagnate within the Berlin tran transition zone with two main levels, 660 and 1,000 kilometers, and they may spend, spend there up to 200 million years. So going from the surface to the bottom will take a long time. In particular, the slabs that uh, are nowadays uh, in, at the core mantle boundaries were uh, clearly uh, slabs that were around Pangea. Uh, and uh, the, the, because of the delay. The second thing that was pointed out by, uh, in particular, Barbara Romanovich, is the re remarkable change of, uh, and, and she did again uh, in an expose with the, for the teachers here that uh, say the same thing. You have a much slower and more vertical and broader plume in the lower mantle down to up to 1,000 kilometers. And then things tend to change. And in particular, they have, you have strong possible deviation. And second, at the top, you often have, within the asthenosphere, an accumulation of lower velocity material, which is presumably hot and presumably plume material. Uh, this is very strong over the the Pacific superswell, super you see there, you see the, the offset with respect to the, the hot spot at the top. It, it's not necessarily immediately below. You may see deviation. And then a spectacular thing is this recent thing by Nelson and Gran. All that was presented by Barbara Romanovich. Uh, Nelson and Gran below uh, Yellowstone, and you see it comes here. Presumably, it may come here, so that's an offset of about uh, uh, more than 1,000 kilometers, and possibly join there. But what, to me, is the most remarkable thing, the offset, I, I'm not surprised, you should expect that, but the, the most remarkable is the accumulation of hot material below the continental lithosphere. This is what you would expect, really. So, do we have two coupled circulation system with limited leak leakage? That's a possibility. Uh, sluggish convection, a vertical thick plane below 1,000 kilometers. Multiple deflected vanishing structure above 1,000 kilometers. Frequent absence of direct continuity across 1,000 kilometers. Large offset between lower mantle plume and hotspot at the surface. Accumulation of hot plume material within the asthenosphere. And, uh, and Davai has mentioned that she considered the atmosphere as a plume graveyard. So now you have three reservoirs, really. You have the asthenosphere, which accumulates plumes, especially below continents. You have the discontinuity upper lower mantle, which accumulates slab during perhaps 200 million years or more. And finally, you have the lowermost mantle, the core boundary that accumulates slab. You see three different. Thing, which introduces a time lag, uh, which means that the, if you want to have circulation, the minimum amount of time is find of about 500 million years. Uh, an interesting point, uh, no, a, although a great part of the slab accumulated over the CMB came from the circumpangia hemispheric subduction, part came from the Tetis. And let me just show you the, the implication, you see. Here is the, the uh, reconstruction of Pangea 220 million, million years, the tate is there. And here is the, the, this funny shape of the positive of the geoid of the Atlantic. Notice this reentrant there of the negative. And this is exactly where the slabs of uh, the tate is accumulated at the time. So I suggest that this slab and some modelization show that the slabs tend to push laterally 
the low velocity of this cordon, has pushed the system and then pushed it toward the north. And that actually, when you compare this and this, you can transform that in, this into that by just taking this thing and pushing it back there. And that is the result of this static equatorial zone. OK, so I come to the close to the conclusion. Exciting insight, but still a lot of questions and apparent contradictions. Suggests to me a situation similar to the one between 60 and 65. Some question, is the upper mantle circulation partly decoupled from lower mantle one? What were the cause of the Cretaceous catastrophe, strictly related to excess heating of Pangaea lithosphere, and or to increase the coupling between upper and lower mantle circulation? Has this process an inherent periodicity of about 500 million years? Why was Pangaea stationary, stationary and strictly contained within a polar hemisphere during 250 million years? What were the respective roles of the thin Cordilleran outer tectonic zone and its thin inner equatorial tectonic zone with respect to the immediate cratonic thick zone? Uh, no, I want to move. But the main question to me says, how did order two mental convection give this rise to order one distribution of continent and ocean? And I do not have the answer for you. So I conclude with that and with this big thing that is this reconstruction of Pangaea during 250 million years. And I think we have not looked sufficiently at the way it proceeds. And I think I have developed that elsewhere with my friend Shengor and Imren, that the tectonic style even is different. You should expect a different tectonic style. Thank you very much. So there is no other section after us, so we have ample time for questions. Any questions? Yes. Let's come to the... Uh, interesting presentation. The thing I would agree with is the timing of the slab in the transition zone. The time, the time that the slab is in the transition zone, you say, can be up to 200 million years, even longer. But if you think, this is a very simple calculation, you think about a subduction rate of 5 centimeters a year, and you multiply that by 200 million years, then you have a 10,000 kilometer long slab. There just isn't enough space to store slab in a transition zone for such a long slab. So I would say it's at least an order of magnitude shorter. Maybe 10, 20 million years you can store a slab in a transition zone before it sinks down. But 200 million years, I don't think it's realistic if you believe the tomography models we have at present. Could you comment on that? If you allow me, I will disagree. Uh, because what you do is, when the slab comes down, you see that in the Tethys area, it's very spectacular. They accumulate between 660 and 400 kilometers or so. And they pile up. So the, it makes a big thickness. It's, it's not like a single slab. It's thickening. And as a result, the thermal inertia is, of course, uh, much, much low, much uh, larger, because it will take much longer time to cool that. And the total volume being at least two or three times more than the volume of the thing that came down, I think the, reason, the reasonable thing is certainly more than 100 million years. Certainly not. But, but the slab that goes down, down to the 660, is maybe, a th maybe seven, eight, one, 700 kilometers long, maybe 1,000 kilometers. If you multiply that by three, you have 3,000 kilometers. But if you, as I said, the simple calculation, five centimeters a year over 200 million years gives you 10,000 kilometer long slab. It, it just isn't there in the tomography. Look, I mean, this, this has to be decided by a modeler, and I'm sure they will see that. But my point is that you accumulate a lot of slab material, and actually the slab thickens most of the time. 
because you see the, the thickness is much larger than it was uh, uh, when it was in the, in the part that is descending. Other questions? No? Okay. Thank you. So, we thank you very much again. <laughs>